Let's take a short look at submarine warfare of the First and Second World War in the Atlantic. In the First World War, the early successes of the submarines against warships convinced both the British and the Germans that a submarine was a formidable weapon. Soon after the British naval blockade of Germany in 1914, the Germans used their U-boat fleet to attack the British merchant shipping and was initially still following price laws. Nevertheless, these actions and several incidents led to international pressure. Thus for quite some time the Kaiser only allowed restricted submarine warfare. This changed later on in the war. Due to various incidents like the sinking of the Lusitania, the stance of the United States to Imperial Germany changed and ultimately led the United States to the entry of the war on the sides of the Allies. This was quite different to the Second World War, where the Kriegsmarine from the start of the war tried to use its U-boat primarily against merchant shipping in order to cripple the British economy. Yet similarly, the international price laws were initially followed. Nevertheless, even when those laws were not followed anymore, there were no frictions with the United States. Due to the fact that the United States this time declared Europe a war zone and prohibited its merchant fleet to enter those areas. This also included various ports in Africa. Yet later Roosevelt took a more aggressive stance, which led to several conflicts between Germany and the US Navy. For further details on this, check out my video on the Allied and German Atlantic strategy. A key difference on the strategic level was that the Germans had access to the complete French, Dutch and Danish coast after the fall of France in 1940. This allowed the U-boats to be deployed and maintained closer to the Atlantic. One key similarity was that both the German military and political leadership overestimated the submarine as a weapon system after the early successes in the wars. Probably one of the best known measures to counter enemy submarines is the convoy system. Although this wasn't something new, it was already used long before the world wars. Yet the Royal Navy reluctantly adopted the system in 1917. The change from grouping ships into convoys led to notable reduction in losses. By October 1917, over 1500 merchant ships in about 100 convoys had reached the British Isles. Only 10 ships were lost to U-boats while sailing in these convoys, one ship out of 150. By comparison, the loss rate of ships sailing independently, inbound and otherwise was 1 in 10. A convoy has several benefits. First of, a rather small number of escort ships can be used to protect a larger amount of non-combat vessels. Now this system has another benefit. A large number of ships is concentrated in a rather small space. As a result, German submariners often couldn't find any ships after widespread use of convoys in World War I. In case they encountered a convoy, it was escorted by ships that threatened the submarine and thus made any attack at least more difficult or outright dangerous. Hence the effectiveness of the submarine was limited. It is important to note that even in Second World War most submarines were quite slow when submerged. Additionally, merchant vessels were not always sunk by torpedoes but also by deck gun or scuttling, thus saving precious torpedoes. A close analysis of U-boat successes in World War I shows that they sank the overwhelming majority of Allied ships not by torpedo but by deck gun in British coastal waters and in the Mediterranean Sea where maritime traffic was dense. Immediately after the outbreak of the Second World War, the British adopted the convoy system. But this time there was a counter used by the Germans, the so-called wolf packs, namely using several U-boats in a coordinated attack on a single convoy. Why wasn't this approach used in the First World War? Well, for several reasons. First off, there was no central submarine command in the German Navy in World War I. Thus, submarine warfare and construction wasn't coordinated on a high level. Second, the technical limitations, namely radios, didn't allow an easy and effective land-based coordination of several submarines. Now why was the Wolfpack tactic so successful against convoys? Well, let's take a look. Here is a convoy and here is a lone submarine. Now if we just add three escort ships and a submarine attacks, two escorts can go hunting for a submarine while one helps the attack ship. Now a similar scenario where several submarines attack, the escorts are forced to decide if they split forces or not. If they do, for instance they hunt the attacking submarine, they allow the other submarines to have an easier approach. Also assisting an attack ship would make the escort far more vulnerable because no one knows how many submarines are still out there. Hence the convoy system against a coordinated attack is quite vulnerable, unless sufficient number of escort ships is provided. 
Yet, till 1941, for a convoy of 45 ships that took the space of about 17 square kilometers, only four to five escort ships were available. Also, some of these ships had such limited performance that sometimes surface U-boats were fast enough to escape them. This problem was solved by the Allies over the course of the war by providing more escorts, forming them into support groups and various other measures. Yet one aspect that is often overlooked is the fact that a convoy can be steered around locations with reported submarine activity easier than several single vessels. One major aspect of submarine warfare is of course the art of how not to be seen, which is also sometimes called the Monty Python Doctrine. There were various wrong assumptions in the beginning of the First World War. It was assumed, since submarines had to travel mostly surfaced, that they could be easily detected and thus shot or rammed. But detecting them when surfaced was quite a challenge. Yet an initially successful ramming attack enforced this belief and thus delayed the abandonment of this flawed assumption by the Royal Navy. So let's look at various detection techniques and technologies in both wars. One crucial element of submarine warfare back then was visual spotting. The Atlantic is not a lake, thus there are quite some waves and the conning towers of submarines are quite small. A common misconception about submarines in both world wars is that they traveled mostly underwater. But this is not true. For operational and strategic movements, submarines almost exclusively travel surface. After all, the U-boats, except for the last German types, were basically torpedo boats that could dive. They were not optimized for underwater movement. Even tactically, submarines quite often, especially in the early war, attacked while the first, usually under the cover of the night or bad weather. Yet although the small conning tower is great for not being seen, it also makes spotting the enemy ship quite difficult, because the visual range is rather limited. This was a major problem for the Kriegsmarine, especially since recon operations by the Luftwaffe were limited or impossible due to the range or area. As a result, the submarines had to spot for themselves. If there was an estimated convoy nearby, they were coordinated in a patrol line to cover an area to minimize ships and convoy passing through. The maximum distance in good conditions was about 32 kilometers or 20 miles. This is also the reason why the convoy system in the First World War had such a tremendous effect. Since the submarines weren't coordinated, their chance of finding a convoy were quite limited. Because in the fastness of the ocean, a convoy is not really bigger than a single ship. But the chances of running into one out of 45 ships is substantially higher than running into one convoy consisting of 45 ships. Now let's look at some technologies. To the major rise of losses from submarine attacks in 1915, the British devoted major resources to anti-submarine warfare. This led to the use of hydrophones, which were early versions of passive sonar, which is basically an underwater listening device. The problem was that hydrophones only worked when the listening ship was not moving, and even so the range and direction of a surface submarine was hard to determine. When World War II started, active sonar was developed and used on escort ships. Active sonar is basically sending out sound waves that are bounced back if they hit a the solid object, which is commonly referred to as pinging. To give you some performance data on sonar, the early war range of a sonar was around 1400 meters, mid-war at around 3700 meters. Generally, slower speeds of the searching vessels allowed for a better detection. A drawback of sonar was that they couldn't detect subs that were too close thus creating detection gaps, especially during depth charge attacks. Yet probably a major drawback of active sonar was that it could only detect submerged submarines. Since the Germans initially relied heavily on night attacks with surface submarines, the Allied sonars couldn't detect any submarines, even when they were in proximity. Which brings us to the next point, radar, which wasn't available in the First World War. Radar was one of the most crucial developments in naval and not just submarine warfare. Yet, in 1939, the available types were mostly ineffective for the use against submarines. Due to reliability issues and the rather small signature of U-boat conning towers. Additionally, the number of equipped vessels was low. This changed considerably over the course of the war and ultimately allowed the detection of German submarines during night and bad weather, which were once the primary cover for submarine attacks. The captains were often unaware 
that they were already detected, since the threat posed by radar wasn't correctly identified by the German submarine command for some time. Radar became even more deadly when a sufficient number of Allied aircraft were equipped with radar that allowed the detection of submarines. After all, submarines were still dependent on surface movement for operational and strategic movement. This only changed when the snorkel was introduced in 1944 that allowed submarines to operate by taking air in while submerged. Yet its usefulness was limited in the open sea and provided only a distinctive advantage in inshore waters. Let's look at another major source for detecting submarines and convoys, signal intelligence. In World War I radio transmissions were rather new, yet the British excelled in the use of this technology. Additionally, they captured a German naval codebook early on. Thus they had an extensive knowledge of the German ship positions and often also the composition of various flotillas. Furthermore, the British perfected radio direction finding and could pinpoint various German transmitters. And even this knowledge was of limited effectiveness, since only a small number of German submarines were sunk. Although the Germans learned in the interwar period about their compromised situation in World War I and they took various steps to prevent it from happening again, yet they only succeeded to a limited degree. Signal intelligence operations in World War II regarding anti-submarine warfare was very dynamic. There was a constant back and forth, like the capture of Enigma codes by the Allies, the improvement of Enigma machines by the Germans, the change of codes, etc. etc. Something that is clearly worth its own video. Additionally, the Allies developed high frequency direction finding, often called HAFTAF, which was an improved version of radio direction finding that allowed the detection of range and bearings of nearby submarines once the submarine sent a short message, like a contact report, which were crucial for the coordination of wolf packs. Now, a main difference between the two World War was that the British used a convoy system from the get go in World War II, thus, they could use the gathered intelligence effectively. Regular and timely reading of this ultra-intelligence allowed convoys to be routed safely for much of the period and may have saved 300 Allied ships in late 1941. Although there was sometimes serious suspicion on the German side that the encryption system was compromised, internal assessment determined wrongfully that the system was secure. One aspect that is rarely mentioned is the tracking of convoys by the Germans with the use of signal intelligence. The German Naval Signal Intelligence Unit, the B-Dienst, often provided crucial data on the size, position and direction of the enemy convoys. This information was crucial for setting up submarines and patrol lines to find and intercept enemy convoys. Furthermore, by the time of the most crucial stage in the Battle of the Atlantic in 1943, the B-Dienst was able to decipher the vital U-Boot Situation Report this was radioed to convoy commanders at sea to tell them about the known and suspected positions of U-boats in the area. Now time to move a little bit up. Let's talk about the use of airplanes in both world wars. Airplanes in World War I were a rather new technology. Thus the range, reliability and loadout was limited. Nevertheless, the appearance of an aircraft forced the submarine to dive. Thus it became basically immobilized and needed to use its battery power which was quite limited. Thus, using airplanes for coastal convoy escorting could have had a significant impact, but it wasn't used until April 1918. In total, nearly 500 aircraft and 75 blimps were used against German submarines in World War I. Yet there's only one confirmed kill out of a total of 178 combat losses and 39 other losses for a total of 217 submarines lost. In comparison, during World War II, the influence of aircraft in anti-submarine warfare operations was significant. Of the total losses of around 775 U-boats lost during operations, about 250 of those were lost to aircraft alone and around 40 to aircraft and ship cooperation. This is more than 35% of the losses, whereas in World War I the losses to aircraft was less than 1%. Although initially the success of coastal command was limited to the lack of proper equipment and training, over the course of the war the aircraft became the ultimate bane of the German submarines. Still for some time there was an air gap in the Atlantic which was out of the reach of land-based aircraft, yet in May 1943 the air gap was finally closed. Only 50 B-24 Liberators were needed to permanently fix the problem of the mid-ocean air gap.
Furthermore, in 1943, the attack by anti-submarine airplanes against submarines in transit became devastating, even close to the French coast. These attacks even happened during the night. Thus the u boats ultimately became the hunted. There was an attempt to use specialized anti-aircraft submarines to counter this, but it was a disaster. Only bad weather provided some protection and the introduction of the snorkel in 1944. Probably the deadliest form of air power for anti-submarine warfare were the late war hunter-killer groups that consist of several destroyers and an escort carrier deployed by the US Navy. Their planes were equipped with death charges, bombs and homing torpedoes. They could patrol a vast area and the naval bombers often could cruise for several hours. The British tried this approach in the early war but had severe losses and they used their huge and expensive fleet carriers whereas the escort carriers were usually just converted merchant ships and carried only about 20 to 30 planes. Additionally, the US Navy was using a more offensive approach by actively hunting submarines and not merely protecting convoys. One weapon that usually gets neglected as an anti-submarine weapon is the mine. On World War I, a bit more than 25% of German submarine combat losses were caused by mines. And thus was the second largest cause after the attack from surface ships. Mines could be used defensively by denying the enemy the use of certain areas, these were well documented and carefully placed mines. Then there were the offensive minefields, which were usually laid during the night operations in known sea lanes and other places where the enemy was anticipated. Yet the initial attempts of the British to mine the channel were of limited success. Overall, the British mines were of limited quality. As a result, the Dover Barrage could claim only a single U-boat before November 1917, when better mines, some based on captured German designs, became available and around the clock patrols were established. Whereas in World War I, about 25% of the U-boat losses were due to mines, this number was just about 5% in World War II. One main difference in the early stages was that the British were successful in mining the Dover Strait, so that it couldn't be passed by submarines, thus forcing them around the British Isles in order to reach the operational areas in the Atlantic, although after the fall of France, this effect was natural. Probably the best known anti-submarine weapon is the death charge, it is a high explosive charge that is set to explode at a certain depth. Death charges were introduced in January 1916. One of the problems with them was that since they were basically just dropped into the water and then exploded, that the deploying ship had to get a considerable speed not to damage itself. Additionally, only a few were issued, thus the effectiveness was rather limited. In 1916, only 2 out of 29 submarines were lost to the death charges. Yet in 1917 and 1918, the kill rates increased significantly. Yet another major problem was, even if more ordnance was available, the lack of reliable means of detection would have kept the probability of a kill extremely low, as long as targeting a U-boat depended mainly on where it had been last seen. Any chance of success for a craft carrying only a couple of death charges required that it be almost literally on top of the enemy when it was sighted that is within 140 feet of it. It took the introduction of hydrophones and more important larger loadouts for saturation attacks to make the death charge eventually the single most productive U-boot killer in World War I. Yet for the second world war the deadliness wasn't valid anymore. The submarines were more maneuverable underwater and more resistance than in World War I due to valid instead of riveted hulls. Thus prior to the second world war it was wrongly assumed that a single death charge attack could destroy a submarine. Nevertheless, experienced commanders realized about the death charge, the cumulative damage would either sink a submarine or force it to suffice and face the escort's gunfire. Over the course of the war, various improvements were made to increase the effectiveness of death charges by adding weights for faster sinking, increasing the set of death, combining various death settings, increasing the range and upgrading to a stronger explosive charge and other improvements. Nevertheless, the massive problem of the final 200 yard run to the target still remained while the attacking ship Sona was too close to hear the U-boat and be aware of any last minute evasive action. Adding forward firing weapons like the Hedgehog and later the Squid closed this gap in front of the ship. Whereas the Hedgehog was a direct contact weapon, the Squid was basically a death charge mortar. It is important to note that although we often take a look at hunter-killer groups, signal intelligence and death charges, that behind them there was a bigger system deployed by the Allies. The British established in the First World War a trade defense system, 
which was further extended in the Second World War. Naval control shipping operated like a modern air traffic control. Every movement, every route was planned, assigned and monitored. NCS ensured that shipping could be protected either by routing it safely away from danger or by assembling it into convoys so it could be escorted. So similar to the doctrine of not to be seen, there was a doctrine of not being caught with your pants down. The essence of British great defense was avoidance of the enemy. Wartime propaganda described close escorts like the Jervis Bay as the first line of defense. But that was a necessary foresight. The escorts only fought if the intelligence, fleet operations and routing failed. Before we finish this up, let's take a look at the tonnage sunk and submarine lost in both world wars. Important, take these values as a guideline because they are from different sources and different counting schemes. This is the reason why there is a different number here for the total losses given than in the aircraft section. For the First World War, we have a total Allied and neutral shipping sunk of 12,851,000 tons and 217 submarines lost. For the Second World War, the total shipping sunk was 40,242,000 tons and 674 submarines lost. Now as you can see the losses of submarines was three times higher in World War II than in World War I, but the Allied shipping losses were not significantly increased. This is also reflected by the tonnage sunk versus U-boats lost. Yet the picture becomes more interesting if we look at the development of the tonnage sunk versus the U-boats lost over time. As you can clearly see, the peak in the first World War was reached in 1916 and was slight below the peak value of the first period in World War II. In 1917 the value was almost the same like in 1916. And then it went down more than 50% in 1918. Whereas in World War II the value dropped steadily and reached extremely low numbers. Which brings us to the final part of this video. As you saw from these numbers, in World War I the U-boats never stopped to be a serious threat and remained a potent force Whereas in the Second World War around late 1943, the impact of German submarines dropped considerably. In contrast, in World War I, the Allied losses could only be contained in 1917 by adopting a convoy system, yet the number of German U-boats was still increasing. Whereas in the end of the Second World War, the German submarines were mostly hunted and posed no threat to the Allies anymore. Although still a considerable force was needed to contain their operations. The best that the U-boat fleet could claim in 1945 was to tie down enormous Allied forces. Some 800 aircraft and 400 vessels alone were needed to contain the intro U-boat threat in the British Isles by the end of the war. Whereas in World War I, the U-boat's defeat at the strategic level of war bears empathizing, because it can be argued with considerable force that the Allies never quite managed to defeat the German submarine fleet tactically or technically. True, U-boat losses in absolute terms went up very significantly in 1917 and 1918. But these gains become less significant when it is realized that thanks to new construction the overall size of the U-boat threat remained fairly constant. As always, all sources are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.